Good day everyone. It's the time of the week again that you have to pay attention to this course which has come to the second half of chapter 2. Since today's lesson is re related or the continuation of the previous week's lesson, I hope all of you can catch up very fast of what I am about to teach shortly. It's not going to be a long lecture this week, yeah? Alright, let's start with our today's chapter 2b lesson. Okay class, as usual, before we proceed to our lesson, we should look at the syllabus content first. So for today's lesson, we are going to look at uh, 2.3. Cultural Pluralism and Politics of Accommodation Politics of Accommodation is Constitutional Democracy yeah? You already learned about Constitutional Democracy last week So under 2.3 point uh, We will learn about uh, Horowitz Divided Society Which is the Conflict Reduction Theory And then another one, 2.4 Creation of Plural Society which will look at racial composition, the Malays, and also the immigrants. Alright, let's take a look at politics of accommodation first. Okay, so I have told you that politics of accommodation is actually constitutional democracy, which was stated by Aaron Litchfart. So I bet you already knew this four key characteristics very well, yeah? because this was the flashback of last week lesson. Okay, the first one, government by coalition of elites, which includes power sharing, minority veto for the protection of vital minority interests by a mutual veto, proportionality must prevail in the electoral system, but also with regard to civil service appointments and the allocation of public funds. And the last character, segmental autonomy, such as federal arrangements that allow for autonomy in policy fields. Okay, so all four points have been discussed last week, yeah? For instance, the first point, which is the coalition of elites. So, we know that Malaysian politics involves a power sharing between a few political elites from different political parties who come from different background. However, since their common interest is same, they collaborate and cooperate and work together to achieve their objective. Just like what I have said last week, during our 2018 general elections, Tun Mahade and other political elites work together to overthrow the National Front or Barisan National. The second point explains that even a minority group has the right to claim power over the majority. That is why it is called mutual veto. And then uh, point number three which um, related to proportionality Proportionality can be seen from the number of seats allocated during the elections and representatives appointed here. Yeah? And then point number four, related to segmental autonomy, same goes to the state's autonomy in certain fields. In example, immigration power. State government has the rights to control over its immigration matter just like in Sabah and Sarawak under one elite leader. Yeah? Constitutional democracy. What is the debate related to constitutional democracy or what is the weakness? As a matter of fact, some of scholars, especially Donald Horowitz, do not prefer constitutional democracy in explaining the political system in country with plural society. Because to them, Constitutional democracy have its own limitation or weaknesses. It is seen as too limited and its scope is too narrow, in which this theory is heavily relying on elites cooperation as the principal characteristic of a successful conflict management in deeply divided society. 
In other words, the system is seen as too biased or even unfair and has the tendency in looking at the domination or hegemony of high-profile people in politics or only looking at the top management side of a story. Next, I'm going to explain a bit of why constitutional democracy is being questioned. Okay, for first point, grand coalition and the proportionality principle. An essential characteristic of constitutionalism is the inclusion of representatives of all segments of society in the decision-making process by the creation of a power-sharing executive. This inclusion is also to be achieved by the formation of grand post electoral coalitions by proportionality in the electoral system and in the distribution of public offices and resources. Apart from differences in emphasis, most advocates of the constitutional approach share the same core idea which is democratic stability is endangered by majoritarianism but is achieved at the elite level by non-majoritarianism mechanism for conflict resolution. This mechanism should be institutionally anchored in all inclusive governing coalitions. Proportional representation, therefore, is the electoral system that allows for the formation of such grand coalitions. A grand coalition, as envisaged by Lichfart, seeks to ensure a fair representation of all social segments. The constitutional formula for a power-sharing executive seeks to involve representatives of all mobilized groups in a country and suggests that no democratic opposition is necessary to balance the government's actions. So. A question that constitutional theory leaves unanswered, though, is by what mechanism a power-sharing government can be made accountable to the electorate? We move on to the next point, which is segmental autonomy. Another mechanism proposed by constitutionalism is to assign to the elites of each group a large degree of control over its own affairs, either through territorial or institutional mechanism. Such segmental autonomy would have the function of keeping groups separate from each other, since less interaction among different, different segments has the potential to reduce conflict. The constitutionalist plea for social separation raises fears of segmental autonomy becoming a strong incentive for secession. Lichfart argues that there is no empirical evidence to suggest that federalism encourages separatism more than a unitary system. However, the difficulty with the constitutional proposition for segmental autonomy does not rest with the idea of autonomy itself. Rather, it is related to the basic belief of constitutionalism that increased contact between ethnic groups is potentially dangerous. Thus, whilst elite cooperation is crucial to political stability, the segments should remain in relative isolation as good social fences make good political neighbors. It is therefore questionable whether segmental isolation does contribute to long-term political stability and ultimately to the survival of the state itself. Segmental isolation need not be dismissed at all stages of conflict management. Such a formula may be necessary at an early stage of the peace process, especially in the case of violent conflicts, but it is doubtful whether long-term segmental isolation could help maintain a minimal will of the segments to live in the same state. The next one, related to mutual veto. Okay, mutual veto. The mechanism of a mutual veto is regarded as an important constitutional device 
for protecting minorities against the abuses of the majority. The potential of the mutual veto for fostering political stability has been constantly questioned on the grounds that it generates immobility in the decision-making process. The constitutionalist response to this challenge is that even non-decisions are preferable to bad decisions, means non-decision is better than a bad decision. However, such an assert assertion merely compounds the controversy about whether constitutionalism can ensure long-term political stability whilst allowing political life the necessary dynamics that ensure progress. The next one, the roles of elites. Perhaps the most controversial aspect of consociational theory remains the issue of elite cooperation and the relationship between elites and masses. Consociationalism sees the behavior of elites as the essential element of a stable democracy. The central argument of consociationalism is that elite cooperation can successfully overcome the flows of traditional decision-making by the majority. Thus, elites seek to accommodate political conflicts through compromise or amicable agreement. For constitutionalists, this can be achieved by the depoliticization of a given conflict, for example, by defining the conflict as technical, economic, or legal, rather than as an ideological, ethnic, or religious conflict, or by avoiding discussion of the conflict at all. Further, it is suggested that elite cooperation is necessary and sufficient for containing conflict and maintaining political stability. According to North Linger, elites alone can initiate, work out, and implement conflict regulating practices. Therefore, they alone can make direct and positive contributions to regulating outcomes. However, by assuming the difference of the masses to their leaders, Constitutionalists ignore an important reality, that is, in deeply divided societies, social apartheid is often caused by the same elites who are expected by the advocates of constitutionalism to cooperate. Moreover, constitutionalism ignores the role that the masses have, and have in creating or destroying a stable society as there are numerous examples of masses revolting against their cooperating leaders. The relationship between social segmentation and elite cooperation appears to be of minimal importance to constitutionalism since elites are assumed to cooperate and the masses are expected to support their leaders' political strategies. Consequently, no mechanism of controlling elites' behavior is considered necessary. This assumption raises the question of whether a constitutional political system can be referred to as a constitutional democracy since the masses are excluded from any real influence in the decision-making process. So, due to constitutional democracy weaknesses, Donald Horowitz has come out with another alternative theory as recommendations to create more stabilized democracy. Class, as you can see here, Donald Horowitz in his book Ethnic Groups in Conflict has stated that constitutionalism or politics of accommodation only aim to maintain rather than breaking down or eradicate ethnic segmentation. I keep on repeating the same thing yeah, related to consortial democracy. So according to Horowitz, this type of democracy doesn't really look at the deep core of problem in the society itself. Horowitz has suggested integrative approach in 1985 as an alternative to consortialism. He put the role of incentives 
in encouraging inter-ethnic cooperation and moderation. He also aimed at using the institutional devices as a tool in which these devices are structured to provide incentives for moderation and it should be constituency-based rather than only rely on elites or leaders who have the power or authority in the country. In a simple understanding, integrative approach looks at a way on how to manage atau menjaga this multiracial society and at the same time to create survival for the country's political stability. The management of the society is seen best when incentives criteria is being installed through a legal platform, for instance, by a constitution or something else. Okay, but let's talk about the integrative approach or the institutionalization of multiculturalism. Unlike consociationalism, which assumes elite cooperation and relies on minority veto for protecting minorities' interests, the integrative approach relies on incentives for intergroup cooperation, in particular electoral systems that encourage the form formation of pre-election pacts among candidates or political parties across elite, across it, ethnic lines, not elite, huh, but ethnic lines. From the perspective of the integrative approach, the key to intergroup cooperation is to foster a political organization that cross-cuts ethnic loyalties. Horowitz's approach seeks to enhance minorities' influence in majority decision-making by the creation of incentives for moderation by political elites on contentious ethnic issues. Rather than constructing a model of accommodation that sees ethnic groups as separate pillars, Horowitz's model proposes the creation of pre-election coalitions between ethnic parties and ideally the creation of larger multi-ethnic parties that transcend ethnic interest. For example, Horowitz emphasizes the role of economic and regional factors in generating social cleavage that cross-cut ethnic loyalties. The idea of the United States as a cultural and ethnic melting pot is often used to substantiate Horowitz's ideal of non-ascriptive integrative political systems. In order to transform in order to transport, transform, in order to transform a deeply divided society into a stable and integrated multi-ethnic politic, Horowitz proposes five mechanisms of conflict reduction. Firstly, the devolution of the state territorial powers, which would proliferate points of power so as to take the heat of a single local point. So first point is obvious since a democracy system in Malaysia involves power sharing, this kind of separation of powers should be adjusted carefully. Secondly, Devolution of power on ethnic criteria for the purpose of encouraging intra-ethnic competition at the local level. So, according to conflict reduction theory, emphasis should be made towards the competition among the individuals or groups from the same ethnic, for example, one Malay elite leader with another Malay elite leader. Thirdly, the creation of electoral systems that would encourage pre-election coalitions through the process of vote polling. Fourthly, policies to encourage alternative social alignments such as those based upon social class or territory. And finally, a reduction of the disparities between groups through a fair distribution of resources. All right, opinion on both theories, which are the consociational, consociational democracy and also integrative approach. Despite their limitations and unlike incompatibility theories, 
Both models demonstrate that the existence of a stable multi-ethnic state is possible and that severe disputes and outbreak of violence do not represent a tragedy of necessity. Most importantly, both approaches acknowledge the crucial importance of the political participation of minorities through power-sharing arrangements. Finally, the constitutional and the integrative prescriptions for stability in fragmented societies need not be dismissed. Questioning the validity and the applicability of these models, these two models, yeah, does not entail invalidating their basic ideas that elite behavior, electoral systems, autonomy arrangements, and institutional mechanism of conflict regulation have an essential contribution to make to the success of power sharing design and implementation. However, much of the debate on system design in multi-ethnic societies is channeled through the constitutional integrative divide. This has become a false and unproductive dichotomy. Each one of the strategy of accommodation outlined above may be effective and constructive when considering the particular ethnic environments that shape minority and majority interactions. It would be conceptually unrealistic and practically unproductive if one strategy or another were used in its pure form. Both the constitutional and integrative approach to ethnic conflict seek to promote power-sharing executives that are broadly inclusive of all ethnic groups in a multi-ethnic society. Advocates of these approaches remain divided However, over how such coalitions should be shaped and which specific institutions and mechanisms ensure a greater chance of success for political stability. Okay class, we move on to the, the next topic of today's lesson which is the creation of plural society. The creation of plural society is actually very straightforward. Yeah, You already knew it when you learn about the plural society's history. About the Malays, about the immigrants, consists of Indians and the Chinese. Yeah. So creation of plural society 2.4 The emergence of plural society in Malaysia had a close relationship with the process of Western colonialism and the development of colonial capitalism. Plural society in Malaysia does not happen as a voluntary process uh, rather than it was historically forced. So history shaped the creation of plural society in Malaysia. Racial composition Racial composition before independence Before the discovery of teen, teen area Area, yeah, wait In area sites by Long Java in 1848, Malay community formed the majority of the population. Small number of Chinese traders and Indian workers came to work in coffee and sugarcane plantation. So, in mid 19th century, British colonial policies bought extra manpower to work in the various growing economic sectors. So, you can see that in 1921, the Malay population shrunk from 54% to only 49%. In 1931, the population declined to 45%. It started immediately after the British decided to intervene directly in the political affairs of the Malay states in the second half of the 19th century in order to protect its economic interest. As a result of this action, the British has implemented two different policies against the Malays, whom they recognize as Bumiputra citizens or Tuan Punya, owners of the land, and to non-Malays, they regarded as immigrants who had no significant interest in the administration system of states. To conclude chapter 2, we have been looking into some approaches and theories in explaining political situation in Malaysia. The ethnic approach, class approach, and integrative approach. 
I hope all of you still remember those two approaches in understanding Malaysian politics which are the ethnic approach followed by the class approach that I already taught last week. So you have been exposed to certain important concepts such as plural society, primordial sentiments, and consociationalism under ethnic approach. Meanwhile, for class approach, you have learned theories related to class struggle, patronage relationship, and also the neo-feudal concept. And for today's lesson, you only need to understand basic concepts of integrative approach by Donald Horowitz and its comparison to constitutional democracy. Please, yeah? If you still have confusion, do not stop there and keep silent. Do something about it. Okay class, thank you for your attention. For now, please take care and stay safe.